Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Berean Perspective. My name is Kelly Powers. Glad you're here. Please hit that like button. Please subscribe if you're new to check out what's going on. Please leave some comments. What you think of my video response to Joe from the Shameless Potpourri podcast. Recently, in fact, today, if I get this video up, Joe put out a video calling it his best Protestant apologist can't answer this question. And so in his video, which is 50 minutes, I'm going to cover the gist of what he's claiming and leave the rest for other people to check out on their own, because I really want to answer what his argument is and his objection to what he claims Sola Scriptura is and is not. So thank you for being here. I'm glad you're here. I'm going to go through the video here, what he says. Okay. I'm going to address it point by point, little by little here and there in the beginning. And then after that, I'm actually going to then give a very good defense of why Sola Scriptura is not only biblical, but it is in fact necessary. And even early on, early apostolic church fathers believe this as well. So let's get into the video, shall we? First, against the Catholic Church, which argued that we needed the interpretive authority of the church, the reformers, like the Protestant reformers of the 16th century, argued that scripture alone is the infallible authority and scripture is all clear. This is called sola scriptura and the clarity or perspicuity of scripture. And now, before we get too far, would like to point your attention on the screen. If you have your catechism, you can grab your own, or you can go online to the Vatican.va. According to 884, sorry, 85, 86, and 87, according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church in regards to the interpretation, heritage of faith, under 85, 86, and 87 says the following The task of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God, whether in its written form or in form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the church alone. That's talking about the magisterium. So in order for a proper, authentic interpretation of the Bible, God's Word, you need the teaching office, i.e. the magisterium. That's the Pope, the archbishops, and the bishops in general, those who have been entrusted in that teaching office. So in other words, you as a lay person, Protestant, or even a Catholic, honestly, you can read the Bible, but for a proper, authentic interpretation, you must rely upon what they teach. Its authority in this matter is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. This means that the task of the interpretation, task of interpretation have been trusted to the bishops in communion with the successor of Peter, the Bishop of Rome. So they believe those who have been passed on with authority, even after early on, they've now been given this quote-unquote apostolic authority. We don't find that in Scripture, that kind of authority being passed on. 86 says, yet this magisterium is not superior to the Word of God, but its servant. It teaches only what has been handed on to it. At, at the divine command and with the help of the Holy Spirit, it listens to this devotedly, guards it with dedication, and expounds it faithfully. All that it proposes for belief as being divinely revealed is drawn from the single deposit of faith. So, <clears throat> in other words, the magisterium, pope, archbishop, whatever, they don't claim to be a superior to the Bible or God's word, but they claim to be equal on the same grounds. In other words, what a pope says or teaches or magisterium teaches is equal to what scripture teaches. We'll look at that in just a minute. <clears throat> Mindful of Christ's words to his apostles, he who hears you hears me. The faithful receive with docidity the teachings and directives that their pastors give them in different forms. So early on, we see this is this is a fundamental basic teaching of Catholicism. Let me also bring you over here to the next one. The next page here is on 100. Now notice here, this is the kind of an explanation here. In fact, I can read 96. What Christ entrusted to the apostles, they 
in turn handed on by their preaching and teaching under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to all generations until Christ returns in glory. 97. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture make up a single and sacred deposit of the word of God, in which, as a mirror, the pilgrim and church contemplates God, the source of their riches. 98. The church and her doctrine, life, and worship perpetuates and transmits to every generation all that she herself is, all that she believes. 99. Thanks to its supernatural sense of faith, the people of God as a whole never cease to welcome, to penetrate more deeply, and to live more fully from the gift of divine revelation. Now notice this here, 100. This is a big one. The task of interpreting the word of God authentically has been entrusted solely to the magisterium of the church, meaning the Roman Catholic Church. That is, to the Pope and to the bishops in communion with him. Is that what Scripture teaches? Is that what we see that's being passed on? Let me give another one how they interpret tradition. This is again Catechism 80, 81, and 82. Quote 80, sacred tradition and sacred Scripture then are bound closely together and communicate one with the other. For both of them, flowing out of the same divine wellspring, come together in some fashion to form one thing and moves toward the same goal. Each of them makes present and fruitful in the church the mystery of Christ, who promised to remain with his own always to the close of the age. Two distinct modes of transmission. So here's what they say. Sacred scripture is the speech of God. This is number 81 as it's put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit. The holy tradition transmits in its entirety the word of God, which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ, the Lord, and the Holy Spirit. It transmits to its successors of the apostles so that, enlightened by the spirit of truth, they may faithfully preserve and expound, spread it abroad by their teaching. So in other words, Tradition is to be passed on, but where are these traditions coming from? From what Scripture teaches, right? That's what we see. It's being passed on from what the apostles taught. So if true tradition is going to be passed on, it should line up with what God's Word teaches, what the apostles taught. 82, as a result, to whom the transmission, interpretation, revelation entrusted, does not derive her certainty about as revealed from the Holy Scripture alone, but both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and with reverence. So I want to submit to you today as we're going through this, for, for Catholics and those who are in the Catholicism belief, when it comes to Scripture, when it comes to reading God's Word, you must read it in light of the Catholic Church's authority, magisterium in mind. In other words, you truly can interpret the Bible for yourself, despite what may come forth and say, well, you can read it, you can study it, but true interpretation of the scriptures, this must come from the magisterium. Otherwise, you are challenging their authority. So this is important. So as we get into Joe's video, I want to ask you the question. When we're reading scripture, when we're looking at what Jesus taught, when we're looking at what the apostles taught in the New Testament, where do we get the sentiment that we are not as individuals, as true, genuine Christians, whether whatever faith background you may be in regards to a Christian type of denomination, if you're truly born again, where do we get the notion that we are not to truly examine the scriptures for ourselves? to study the scriptures for ourselves, to test what we're being told, study so yourself approved, examine what someone says in light of what scripture teaches, so that way we can know what's right from wrong. If a pope says such and such, or teaches such and such, or a bishop teaches such and such, or a pastor teaches such and such, how will you ultimately know what's right, what's wrong? 
if you're going to rely upon tradition, well, then anybody can make up anything and say it's tradition passed on from the apostles. If it doesn't line up with Scripture, as we understand either Old or New Testament, either from what we know from the prophets' teachings or from what Jesus taught or what the apostles taught, if it doesn't line up, then I would submit to you a very basic fundamental principle. It is not to be accepted. Why? Because it's not lining up with what we've already been given as inspired scripture and divine authority to know truth from error. Now let's get into Joe's argumentation. And I've been referring to this throughout as the Protestant view of Scripture, since it's not just the Lutheran or Calvinist view. It's a pretty standard view of Scripture across denominational lines. For instance, the Book of Concord, which is Lutheran, talks about how Scripture is the only standard by which all teachers and doctrines are to be judged. Agreed. The Westminster Confession of Faith, which is Calvinist, says the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his, meaning God's, own glory, man's salvation, Faith and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. Agreed. And then the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689 says the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. So Agreed. this is. So he's going through these things and he's talking about how this is essentially what he's quoting is mostly from what would be reformers. I'm not reformed, just so someone up may not may not know that out there. But this is accepted generally from within Protestant type of affiliation churches. When it comes to what we believe, essentially we base it on what does the Bible teach, whether it pertains to who Jesus is, the Trinity, the virgin birth, the death, burial, and resurrection, heaven, hell, eternity, things like that. Like the essentials of the faith come down to God as creator. Jesus Christ, who he is, the Trinity, his incarnation, virgin birth, what he did in the cross, what he did in the resurrection, defeat and sin and death, the claim to who Christ is, the true gospel versus false gospels, essentials of what it means to be a born-again Christian. The Bible warns about those who teach a different gospel, teach a different Jesus, warns about false prophets, warns about false teachers. So God's word gives us a lot of information of what to be aware of, to what to be on the lookout for, and what is considered true essential type of doctrine. There's enough of a common Protestant belief that you have, for instance, the book co-authored by a bunch of different Reformed theologians, Sola Scriptura, the Protestant position on the Bible. So to the extent we can talk about anything as like a commonly held Protestant doctrine, this comes pretty darn close. Additionally, there is this second doctrine, the clarity or perspicuity of Scripture, that is closely linked to it. The now, I'm not familiar with that particular book, but I'm going to go out on a limb, and for the most part, probably states pretty close to what I just said a moment ago. Presbyterian theologian Archibald Alexander Hodge, son of the famous Charles Hodge, uh, talks about how in order for Scripture to be the sole and infallible rule of faith, in other words, in order for sola scriptura, this Protestant doctrine, to be true, there are a few things that also have to be true. And one of those things is that scripture has to be perspicuous. Now, again, perspic perspicuity is just a fancy name for clarity. And so, you know, I quoted in the original video I did on this. So, so in other words, for something of, 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 of doctrine or something like that, it must be something that we see clear. Now, the ironic thing is, is that when you're looking early on, I didn't say this where I want to say it now, so I don't forget it. Um, early on, you have the apostles there in the early, the early century, like the first century, the beginning of the church, right? You got the apostle Paul, you've got John and Peter, the various apostles, different leaders, right? Even with them there early on, there were at times factions or divisions or different groups saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter, or I'm of Cephas or whatever else, you know, um groups and, and paul even says hey in first corinthians is is christ divided? who who died for you right you know did i die for you was i crucified for you of course not right we see throughout the various epistles of the apostles addressing false teachers and divisions even paul wrote to the galatians about those who were preaching and teaching a different gospel 
And he actually goes on to say, if someone preaches a different gospel than what we've been preaching to you, meaning the, the, the authority of what the apostles taught, and we have had him down to them, right? Um, they're to be anathema, right? What is the gospel, right? And, and that's really important. What is the gospel? The gospel is simply this, that Christ is the Savior. He's Lord, Son of God, the Messiah, God come in the flesh, died according to the scriptures, according to what Jesus said. He, he was the Messiah who was going to suffer and die according to scripture and be resurrected according to scripture. So we see a lot of emphasis on who Jesus is and what the gospel message is. And yet even early on, even with that leadership, there at times were differences. So what did they do? What did Paul do? He wrote to teach churches. What did Peter do? He wrote to Christians in different areas. He wrote to different churches, right? Wrote to different people, right? Same thing with John. Same thing with James. Same thing with Jude. They wrote to educate, to inform, to equip, to help them know truth from error. So when we talk about scripture, this is important. They just didn't write just to write. They had purpose and meaning. Just like when we read it today, sadly, people just read it for like, you know, fun. I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong. I'm just saying when we read it, we want to read it to be equipped, to draw closer to God, to know truth from error, to know history, to know the things of who Christ is, the Christian church, the gospel, how to be built up in the faith and to pass on these things to other people so they may know the truth of the gospel as well. So my point here is, is that sometimes the arguments is, well, Look at all the Protestant denominations today. There's so much different divisions and et cetera, et cetera. Well, look at the early church. They had the apostles then, and they weren't always in complete, you know, perfectly lining up, right? There was difference. Even times people, Paul had to work, address people talking about the resurrection. Other people were talking about different things about what, what, where do we go when we die? I mean, there's lots of things that needed to be addressed. So just like, over the last four or 500 years of quote unquote, the Protestant Reformation, I think even longer than that. Um, yeah, there's going to be differences of views. But again, here's the point. How do we know if Joe's teaching something true is right or false? How do you know if something that I'm teaching is true or, or false? How do you know if your pastor is teaching something true or false? How do you know? Well, first off, I want to submit to you based on what God's word teaches us, right? Secondly, Jesus taught when, when he was to leave, the Holy Spirit was going to come and he would lead God's people. He would leave the church in truth, in rise, all these different things, right? So this is done individually as well. Now, God calls early on apostles and evangelists and pastors and prophets and whatever else, but the Holy Spirit, just like then, will still lead us today. And so we don't have to rely upon the magisterium. You don't have to rely upon a pastor directly. Now, the Bible tells us that, you know, if it's a true pastor, true shepherd of God, they are called in the ministry to serve. My point, though, is that they, we still examine them. We still test them. We still go to scripture, just like anyone else would. So my point here is that the standard is still what we see as going to scripture. Even for myself, I said, hey, look, I believe the Holy Spirit said such and such, and I'm telling someone such and such. Well, if what I claim the Holy Spirit was teaching me doesn't line up with what we know the Holy Spirit's already given us. We go with this, not with what I think. You understand? That's the difference here. So let's continue on in the video. Subject, Barry Cooper of <laughs> Gospel Coalition, who says, it's the idea that God's word is clear about things that are necessary to be understood and obeyed in order for a person to be saved. The Bible's teaching on salvation can be understood by anyone and everyone. So let's read that again. God's word is clear about the things that are necessary to be understood and obeyed in order for a person to be saved. Yep. Very clear. Very clear when you read scripture. Very clear. You can read John 3, John 5, John 8, John 10, John 14, John 20, um, Acts 10, Acts 15, Acts 16. I mean, 1 Corinthians 15, Romans chapter 1, 3, 4, 5, 8. 10, I mean, the list goes on. Scripture is very clear of what the gospel is, that Christ was crucified, resurrected. He's the Messiah, the Savior, the Lord, died according to the scriptures, and all who call upon him, believe in their heart that he's been raised from dead and call upon him as Lord shall be saved. I mean, the Bible is very clear about this. And it says here, the Bible's teaching of salvation can be understood by 
anyone, everyone. I believe so. I believe so. If someone is truly seeking, right? I believe so. But now, of course, we've got division. We've got heretics. We've got false teachers. We've got false apostles and false prophets, of course, just like we did early on. But when we look at what the gospel is, is it clear? I believe the answer is affirmative. Yes. So there are different ways this has been articulated by different denominational traditions within Protestantism. And the original statements on it were kind of outlandishly bold and had to be kind of dialed back. So originally, Martin Luther in Bondage of the Will talks about how in the external clarity of Scripture, nothing whatever is left obscure or ambiguous. Now, obviously, no one who spent any real time delving through Scripture could hold to this for very long. Because you're Let's look at this together because I'm not familiar with this exact quote. If you speak of the eternal clearness, nothing whatever is left obscure or ambiguous, but all things that are in scriptures in the scriptures are by the word brought forth into the clearest light and proclaimed to the whole world. If you speak of the external clearness, nothing whatever is left obscure or ambiguous, but all things that are in the scriptures are by the word brought forth into the clearest light and proclaim to the world. Well, I don't know what's going on before that quote or after that quote, so I can't speak any more of it. But I believe, as said before, when we look at scriptures, particularly on the gospel, the gospel is quite clear when we're looking at what it means to believe in Jesus and to be saved. But let's continue on. You're going to hit those parts where you say, I just don't know exactly what this passage means. And none of the other passages are helping me understand what this one means. Oh, well, okay, that's what he's talking about. Okay, well, Peter says the same thing. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it says some of the things that Paul writes is hard to sometimes understand. But what does he go on to say? The unstable and untaught. What do they do? They distort that as they do with the rest of the scriptures. Well, the problem here is, is that people twist things who aren't truly taught. They, they wrestle with them, right? What does Paul teach us? Paul teaches us in 2 Timothy 2, he says to study to show thyself approved, a worksman not ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth, right? We're told by Paul, test all things, hold fast that which is good and true, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. We're told even by, by um, the book of Acts, or at least the instruction from the book of Acts, that those who were in Berea, they were hearing and listening to Paul and Silas, Acts 17, 10 and 11, they were listening and they were eager to listen like we should always be eager to listen, every one of us, right? But what does it tell us? It tells us what? That they went to what? They went to the scriptures, examined them to see whether or not what Paul was teaching was true. Paul and his teaching true, right? That is the test. So some people are going to be maybe more educated sometimes, more studied, more students of the Bible, but it still doesn't negate the fact of our responsibility. It's like reading a map. I think later in this video, he talks about a map and, you know, you got a map and one person goes to it and everybody can see, you know, that person can see exactly clear we're supposed to do here and there and there, but then other people come along and it's not so clear. Well, is it the map's fault? Or is it the people who are maybe not paying attention to details, right? The map's still the map. The map is still showing you directions of where you're supposed to go, different places here and there. The map is still right. Just because other people can't do things, go in a certain direction or find their way, doesn't negate the importance and the, valley, the, the val value sorry, of the authority of what that map gives. Same thing for us. The Bible is like our roadmap, our map in life to know how we came into this world, Adam and Eve, creation, how throughout lineages of you know Noah and Abraham and going through all the lineage of the Old Testament, getting up to Jesus, seeing his birth, seeing his incarnation, seeing what we he teaches about himself, all these things. The Bible is a roadmap, Old New Testament, that teaches us a history, teaches us a lot valuable lessons, teaches us prophecies, teaches us principles and morality morals and things like that. It teaches how to live out a Christian life every day in our daily lives, a wisdom to know truth from error. And it teaches us what's yet still to come in the future. So just because sometimes some things might be hard to understand, which I would agree at actually, 
the Bible is not written like, you know, uh, dummy down. It's, it's given to us as a historical narrative and inspired scripture teaching so that we can grow from. The importance here is that we want to study them the best that we can. We don't have to understand everything about it, but God's word is still the rule for our authority. So the Westminster Confession advances a more modest form of the claim that those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are clearly propounded. If they're not in one place, they are in some place else. So clearly, in fact, that not only the learned, but also the unlearned can attain to a sufficient understanding of them using what they describe as the due use of ordinary means. So, so let's read this together. This is the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is Reformed. All things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly profounded and open in the same place of Scripture or other that not only the learned, meaning those who could be very educated, you could have degrees, etc., etc., know many languages, <clears throat> but the unlearned, in a due use of the ordinary means, may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. I would agree. Yes. You know, when you uh, talking to sometimes younger ones, children, younger people, they can understand the basics of the gospel of what it means to be saved. I mean, I became a Christian at a young age, the age of six. I understood the gospel when I was younger. I understood to a certain extent. I understand much more now over time, now being 53. So I've grown over the years, of course. But at the age of six, I understood the basics of who Jesus was, what he came to do. He died upon the cross, rose again. He's the son of God. He's a savior. And those who put their complete trust in him, not in themselves, not in works, anything else, they will be saved. They will be justified. They will have this gift of eternal life so that when they die, they can know they have the gift of eternal life. And that's what I believed when I was young. So yes, this is a correct, once again, statement. These are cross-denominational beliefs, summing up, again, what I'm calling the Protestant view of Scripture. So that's, number one, again, sola scriptura. The Bible alone is the sole infallible rule of faith. So look at his, so here's the thing he's looking at. So two aspects he's going to get into, then he's going to get into his arguments in just a minute, and then we'll all then be responding to, okay? So the two basic views of the Protestant view of Scripture is sola scriptura. The Bible alone is the sole infallible rule of faith, which I would agree on. It, that doesn't mean, sometimes what happens is sometimes people think we can't study and learn outside of Scripture because what about archaeology? What about history? What about the history of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? There's so much documentation that's outside of Scripture that validates the existence of Jesus and the existence of his crucifixion that brings forth confirmation of what we read in the New Testament and the empty tomb as well. So the the view that when we talk about sola scriptura or sola, you know, um, or basically the prime source of authority, often what happens is people say, oh, see, you're only, it's just the Bible alone. You can't read anything else. That's not what sola scriptura actually really is. It's talking about infallible, right? In other words, we can still learn from pastors, teachers, people online, our parents, whatever. We can learn from history, different things, right? Professors. But when it comes to God's inspired and valuable truth on wanting to know truth from error, things on the gospel, things on the creation of man, how we got her, sin, what happens when we die, who Jesus Christ is, all those things, that's what we're talking about. Let's look at number two here. And number two, perspicuity of Scripture. At least all of the essential doctrines are presented in Scripture unambiguously. They're capable of being understood by the unlearned as well as the learned. So this means, as a consequence, that if you are a believer of good faith, if you are someone who is a member of the elect, if God has cast his favor upon you. Now, just to be clear, he uses terms that would be referred to reform people, people of the elect drawn things like that so just to be clear he's talking he's, he's he's commenting here to reformed people at this moment if you're not just acting in bad faith or willfully blind to god something like that <clears throat> and you're using the due use of ordinary means which is a pretty low bar that the unlearned could reach you're gonna know all the essential doctrines now i think what what i've learned over time 
I'm 53 now, and I've been a Christian since the age of six. And I've been through various type of Christian denominations over the year, whether it be uh, Baptist, Pentecostal, Assemblies of God, non-denominational, Calvary Chapel, Methodist, um, some different types of Mennonite type of churches as well. They're more evangelical, pretty good. Uh, kind of a Menno Simons kind of background, if you know anything about him, some different things. Um, they all have issues. So some things, of course, I didn't always agree with, with every different type place. But essentially, essentially, when it comes down to the Trinity, God is creator, God's word is inspired and infallible, our, our rule of faith, virgin birth, right? The incarnation that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. Uh, his crucifixion, he died according to the scriptures, was resurrected according to the scriptures. He is the only way unto the Father. There's no other way. There's no other name but heaven by which we must be saved. The reality of hell, that when we die, there is this place of type of judgment. Uh, the reality that those are in Christ, we have the gift of eternal life. Uh, that Jesus Christ is coming back a second time. He's going to return. I, I, I would say, very safe to say that these things, when we read of them, they are clear. Now, some there'll be some different nuances and different variations that sometimes people will take some different views, but essentially those are the essentials of the faith that I think any, from what I've learned over the years, and I've been a Christian now going on what, 46 something plus years, various types of denominations, and I know multiple other types of denominations as well that I'm familiar with, essentially these are the core doctrines of the Christian faith. So uh, uh, unless something can be presented otherwise as something that I'm talking about, this is what essentially, quote unquote, Protestants will talk about the essentials of the Christian faith that I believe are clear and understandable. So that's the Protestant mm -hmm. argument writ large in a nutshell. In response to that, here is my really simple, straightforward argument that somehow, despite multiple response videos, no one seems to have responded to. And goes, this is what caught my attention. Now, he's going to be addressing other people. I'm not on his list. Apparently, I'm not. Uh, even one of the guys he mentioned, I am I'm have a much bigger channel than him. But apparently, this other guy's obviously on, on his radar. Maybe at some point, maybe I'll get on Joe's radar and he can start responding to some of my stuff. Maybe you might even see this video. And if you watch this, Joe, hey, respect to you. I have no hatred towards you, nor any other Catholic apology or any Catholics that in general. I'm just taking a stance, what I believe, what scripture actually teaches and historically on this matter as well. I actually hope you do come across this video and maybe we might have some exchanges back and forth and who knows, maybe even have a live discussion at some point. I'm very open to that. But what he said here is that he basically says, and you can see that the best Protestant apologist can't answer this argument. So this is his argument. Now, this is Joe's essential argument, his whole video. It's 50 minutes, but this is the, this is the, the the gist of it all this is the thrust of his argument because he starts addressing other reformers and different people throughout the rest of the video that really isn't relevant to what what's going to go on now so this is going to be his basic thrust of his argument and now we're going to get into what he says really no protestant apologist really can answer this argument so let's see what he says it's like this premise one if the protestant view of scripture is correct Sincere believers will all agree on the essential doctrines. So, premise number one, argument. If the Protestant view of Scripture is correct, i.e. sola scriptura, meaning as God's word is the final authority, truly the only infallible soul for authority of truth that we can go to, right, in the final matters, sincere believers will all agree on the essential doctrines. Now, I actually, over the years, believe this actually is true. If someone who holds to scripture, right, as their authority, right, and claims to be a Christian, but then says they don't believe that, say, God is the creator of all things. That'd be weird, wouldn't it? Aliens? I don't know. If someone said, well, I, you know, I, I, I claim to be a Christian, but I, this is God's word, but then, you know, Jesus is the best way, but he's not the only way. Could they come to that conclusion? Or the fact that, well, you know, I know that Jesus, um, you know, he came here, he suffered, but I don't really think he actually died upon the cross. See, these would be all weird, bizarre things, right? But if someone really holds to Scripture, 
then I actually believe they're going to hold to what the Bible actually teaches. If they're if they're born again, and if they're a true Christian, meaning you know they're truly born again, a child of God, the essentials of the faith, they will believe God is creator. They will believe in the Trinity. They will believe in the deity of Christ. They will believe that he is the son of God, the savior, the Messiah, the one that came and took on flesh through his incarnation, died according to the scriptures and rose again. And all who call upon him and believe in their heart, he's been raised from dead, shall be saved. I, I believe that sincerely. If someone claims to be a Christian and yet holds the scripture, but rejects these things, then I don't believe they're truly holding the scripture directly as what the scriptures. They've been confused. They've been taught a false doctrine that doesn't negate or come against sola scriptura it means they have a twisted version of what scripture teaches just like we see the bible warning about premise two sincere believers do not all agree on the essential doctrines and in the earlier videos i give tons of examples of that yes this is true just like i just said and even early on when you look at what paul wrote to the corinthians he had to address multiple things. He had to write multiple things. But see, the thing is, what did he do? He wrote to them and he taught them scripture, doctrine, and teaching, and claimed that his, his, his teachings are inspired by God. He wrote to the Galatians. What did he do? He wrote to them to address the book of Galatians to those in Galatia, the Christians who were being led astray by the Judaizers, right? So what's the point of his letters? The point of his letters are authority, inspiration, to know truth from error. So just because sometimes we have believers who don't always agree, quote unquote, on essential doctrines, it's either two things. They're not genuine believers or for a time they've been led astray and we got to bring them back to what God's word teaches. Conclusion, therefore, the Protestant view of Scripture is not correct. So his argument is this. I, no disrespect to Joe. And it's throughout his whole video, right? This is his premise throughout the whole video. This is a really extremely weak argument. I have to, I'm actually kind of like, he responds to multiple other people throughout the video. Uh, and he talks about multiple people. I, he says that no one's ever responded to him. I, I find that kind of, I don't know, baffling to me, bizarre, strange, because they, they've had to. Or maybe they didn't know that he was addressing them. I don't know, because honestly, I've heard a lot stronger arguments against, quote unquote, sola scriptura, right? So let's, let's go back to his premise here. If the Protestant view of scripture is correct, sincere believers will agree on the essential doctrines. That I, I actually think that is actually very true. Point number two, sincere believers do not agree on the essential doctrines. Well, th this is sincerely right, and they could be sincerely wrong. Doesn't mean they're also necessarily believers. They could be counterfeit believers as well. We don't know that. Now, sometimes there are certain things. Let's say, well, let's say essential. What, what classifies as essential? If you believe in pre-tribulation or post-tribulation, which one's essential? What matters is you believe that Jesus Christ is coming back. That's the essential thing. Having some different nuances or different views of slight variations, that's not going against sola fide. We still want to be Bereans. We still want to study God's word. We still want to examine things. We want to test what we're being taught as well. So that doesn't negate that as well. And lastly, C, conclusion, he says, therefore, the Protestant view of Scripture is not correct. No. Just because there might be some differences here and there, that still doesn't change God's word. Just like on a map, you have a map of going to different places and, and a certain location. And say you got 20 people, and he did, I think, later in the video, and, and say one guy finds it, and say it's only one, right? And the other 19 don't find it. Does it say that the map was horrible? Or maybe the other 19, maybe they just had their own views. Maybe they didn't want to listen to what the map said. Maybe, you know, this is a true story. Sometimes when I go traveling, we've got our, you know, our phones and our GPSs and whatever else, right? And sometimes I'm like, just turn that thing off. Let's drive. Come on, let's ride, man. Let's ride, right? Like, that's how I sometimes, that, that's how we used to be. Like, you know, I'm, like I'm 53, so I'm trying to remember back how old I am now. So I got my first driver's license was a little bit later after high school. 
I was roughly 19. So that would have been roughly 1990. I didn't get one right away, but I had a, I had a permit. I could drive and all that. Right. But when I finally got my own car back in those days, we didn't have internet. We didn't have the GPSs. What did we use? We opened up those big hunky, you know, weird maps. Right. And, and they were fun, but they still gave us the right location. They still gave us the right directions. It wasn't the map's fault. If I didn't get it right, it wasn't the map's fault, right? It still gave us the right information. The thing is, though, sometimes we have a map right in front of us and we don't listen to the map. I've done it before. I know sometimes even GPS. When I'm out and about and the GPS says such and I'm like, I'm going over here. And I did it and like, oh, right? So the point here is, is that you can't say solo scriptura is not right just because there's going to be some differences of views at times just like you can't say the map is wrong or the map isn't the right way or the right thing to do just because sometimes people can't follow the instructions right and so therefore when he says therefore the present view of scripture is not correct i think that's a very 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 weak argument and i think really it's it's not really understanding truly what solo scriptura is all about so that's it you know, like if you're right about the nature of scripture, it's all clear and it's all we need, then it's going to follow that everybody who is a believer and of good faith is going to come to the same beliefs on at least the essential doctrines. What we find is Protestants, good faith seemingly, Protestants don't agree with one another. Forget Protestants don't agree with Catholics or Protestants don't agree with... I would like to ask Joe if you, if you by chance watch this, Joe. which sincere true genuine believers who believe in sola scriptura which essential doctrine do they not agree on i'd like to ask that talking essential doctrine now which essential doctrine would you say the baptists don't agree with pentecostals essential doctrine which doctrine would you say a non-denominational church say I'll, I'll throw out calvary chapel some of my background that i have been a part of over the years which essential doctrine would you say they may believe that say a baptist church doesn't we're talking essential doctrine what when we define essential doctrine what is that see joe really even hasn't even described that i've said it numerous times already what i would consider i believe biblically speaking and things that i've shared you can go right to the scripture and read those yourselves it wasn't very hard right so when he says this what what exactly is an essential doctrine he says that multiple people aren't actually believing in it. are we talking about the differences of eschatology are we talking about the mode of baptism because some people believe in immersion some people believe in um you know sprinkling some people believe you know you can pour water over them um you know the issue of spiritual gifts, like, you know, some people believe in gifts, some people don't, are those aren't considered, quote unquote, essential doctrines of how, you know, are the gifts or not for today or what, you know, a mode, if you will, of how we're to be baptized. Now, I, of course, believe in full immersion. I believe that. But I wouldn't say that if someone, quote unquote, wasn't fully immersed, I would never say, biblically speaking, they're not saved. Why? Well, it doesn't say that exactly, right? So when we're talking essential doctrine, what exactly are you talking about, Joe? I'd like to, if, if you get, if you by chance watch this, Joe, I'd like to know. Orthodox Protestants don't agree with Protestants on the essential doctrines. In fact, they don't even agree on which doctrines are essential. Now, see, I don't, I don't think that's true. What he just said. Like I said, I've been around for a while. You know, some people might consider me an old fart. Okay. Um, I've been through many different types of churches, denominations over there. I've been in leadership. I've been a pastoral type role. I've been an elder. I've served in children's ministry. I've served in youth. I've done missions and outreach, etc. I've served in different types of denominations over the years. Everyone that I've ever been to, they've all had the essentials the same. So I'd like to know when he says this kind of statement, what are you actually saying, Joe? You're just making a blatant statement, but you're not actually qualified. You're not saying, well, this group over here says this, and this group over here says this. They both claim these are essentials, but they divide. i like to know, Joe. Can you help me out, Joe? Now, I want to specify here what the argument isn't. And you'll see why it's really important, because a lot of people have been making hay of straw men. <laughs> you know, like they're just attacking these beliefs that are not the argument that I just laid out. 
and are instead arguments that I'm not arguing and have not been arguing. So let's talk about the arguments that I'm not making. Number one, I'm not saying any system in which people disagree is automatically false. So these are going to be now his kind of, after he gave his argument, he's going to be explaining this was not what he's arguing for, which I kind of respect, of course. So let's let's hear him out. That's a ridiculous position. And you're right. You could you could destroy that position because it's so silly. It's actually interesting. He says any system in which people disagree with one another is automatically false. That's what he's not saying. In fact, here's the ironic thing. And the odds of Catholics watching this are probably going to be safe. There's going to be Catholics and Protestants watching this. I have Catholic background in my former family, and I've shared this before in my channel. And um, and I talk to Catholics on a regular basis. Talk to a few different people regularly, and not all Catholics actually agree on everything. Like I know different Catholics who don't believe in the issues of the dogmas of Mary. I know different Catholics who don't believe in the Pope. I mean, look at Timothy Gordon. Timothy Gordon, who is a Catholic apologist, who lately and for a bit, actually longer than a bit, he's been actually calling out the Pope saying he's an anti-pope. He's a he's not a true pope and he's been calling out lots of different things. Well, how does that work if you're a Catholic yet you don't believe the pope is truly the pope, right? I've talked to other Catholics who, you know, they believe in um the sacraments, but they will say, well, you know, I don't essentially believe that if you're not a Catholic, you're not saved. But yet the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that you must be in the Catholic Church in order to be saved, and you must be baptized. That's one of the sacraments to be saved. Not all Catholics agree with that either. Not all Catholics actually agree with a lot of things when it comes to certain teachings of the Catholic Church. So of itself to say, you know, well, as, as he's trying to say here about the Protestant, well, the same thing as he said, it could be said about Catholic, it could be said about others as well. So I'm glad he says that, because then if it was the case that he was trying to say, well, then he automatically would refute himself and say, well, then the Catholic Church would not be true. The fact is there's always going to be some disagreements with people within any type of religious or Christian type of affiliation. Number two, Protestants disagree on things and therefore Catholicism is true. Now, look, denominationalism is a scandal, but that's not the argument I'm making. Now, I didn't like that statement. I didn't like that statement. So Protestants disagree on things, therefore Catholicism is true. Now, I, I, I'm glad he said that's not necessarily his argument. But he said denominational is, is, is a scandal. No, that that's a really I don't think he meant it like that. You know, I don't want to I don't want to poke at Joe and and, and misrepresent Joe because he, he does actually seem like an all right guy. Um, denominations more or less, I think, are sad because it causes sadly divisions. Right. Sometimes it can be good because then you're taking a certain stand for truth, because sometimes you got a certain group that might splinter off and they're getting maybe a little wonky. Right. And you got another group. So, you know what? We're going to hold to what God's word says here. So sometimes denominations can be also good because they're taking more of a biblical stance, actually, on what God's word says rather than man's traditions. Uh, I'm sorry. I got to throw that out there. Catholicism. Right. Because a based a lot of teachings of the Catholic Church are based on the traditions of man. A lot of things, right? So, uh, oh, well, can everybody think, well, Kelly, you make a statement just like that. You said Joe wouldn't say it. All right, let's talk purgatory, intercession of the saints, Marian type of dogmas, um, sacred tradition is equal with scripture. That, that, that should be suffice right now. Those things are all unbiblical uh, in their, for their forms. Those are traditions of men. So here in regards to Protestants disagree on things, therefore Catholicism true, I'm glad he's not using that argument as well. Number three, Catholics are less divided than Protestants, and therefore Catholicism is true. But also not the argument I'm making. As you know, you could come up with your own religion <clears throat> where it's just you and your wife or your friend or whoever, and you have like a long list of very specific doctrines, and you might have complete unity on a weird laundry list of doctrines. That is not my point at all. My point is sola scriptura does not reliably and safely get you to orthodoxy. All right, so let's stop there for a quick sec. So Catholics are less divided than Protestants, therefore Catholicism is true. Well, that might be the case, but I would actually probably say that I think the Orthodox or the Greek Orthodox actually is more united than Catholics, Catholicism, does that make them more true? Hmm. 
What about the Jehovah's Witnesses? Now, of course, I know they're false because Jehovah's Witnesses teach all kinds of atrocities against the Trinity, the Eucharist, Christ, salvation, faithful in seats, grave, all kinds of things. But they still will read the Bible. But their authority, you know, I had a, a discussion with Trent Horn a little while back on my channel. If you haven't seen that by chance, go check it out. And Trent Horn was talking about, you know, um, the issue. This was actually our main discussion was actually on Sola Scriptura. So I definitely want to encourage you to go check it out. Um, he brought up how, say, for example, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh day Adventists, other groups like that would actually not Mormons, Seventh day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses would say they are Sola, Sola Scriptura. I was like, no, no, they're not. He's like, no, yeah, they are. And he, he really didn't understand that. And he totally, totally dropped the ball. See, Jehovah's Witnesses will go to scripture. This is true. They will. But they're taught by their authority, what's known as the anointed class or the governing body, that they can't interpret the Bible for themselves. They must rely upon the faithful and discreet slave. Wait a minute. That sounds kind of vaguely familiar to Catechism 95, Catechism 100, that you as a Catholic can't actually authentically interpret the Word of God without the magisterium. Whoa, wait a minute. Drop the ball already, huh? Um, wow. So, yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses, they're not completely Sola Scriptura. Seventh day Adventists, they are also lined up with Scripture as well, but they still have to submit also to their authorities when it comes to certain teachings as well. So, when we're talking about the issue here of Sola Scriptura, in the end, is th this is the basic question for anyone listening right now. Or Joe or anyone else. At the end of the day, when you listen to a priest, a father, the Pope, or if you're a Protestant or something else, you listen to a pastor, an elder, someone teaching, whatever it may be, and, 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 you're, and they're teaching something of spiritual matters. Do you assume they're right? Automatically? Do you, do you not test or examine Check out what they're saying. Now, if you're familiar with it already, then of course, then that then you're already familiar with it, right? But are we not encouraged, instructed, given exhortations at times to study God's word, to be careful of false teachings and false doc doctrines and false prophets and false apostles and false teachers and encourage that when we're listening to test things? Yes, yes. So we're not just to assume or listen, like if you're listening to Joe or you listen to me, at the end of the day is how do you decide what's true and what's false? How do you decide it? Do you just go with the flow? Do you just flip a quarter? Do you cast lots? What do you do? I want to submit to you at the end of the day that the answer should be is you're going to God's word. In the sense of small o, like Christian solid beliefs. <clears throat> How do we know that? Well, because of the massive disunity that we see among people who try to follow that roadmap. Like if you had a map and someone said, oh, this map is so clear. Here it is. But then 20 people tried to follow the map and they ended up in 20 different places. You might reasonably say, hmm, maybe the map's not as clear as people thought it was. Now, that was that was what he was saying. That's what I talked about earlier. So you got 20 people and they go 20 places. Well, if, if all 20 people went to 20 different places, then that might be a good scenario. But what if five of the 20, what if 10 of the 20 made to the right location? Would, would, you, would you still fault the map? See, you can't fault the map just because people can't follow instructions, right? And the instructions might be simple and clear, but a lot of times we don't want to follow those instructions. We want to do things our way we read into things what we want to see isa jesus we do the traditions of men rather than the teachings and instructions of what god's word actually teaches but instead you find people just attacking again this total straw man that my argument is simply you have disunity and <coughs> therefore protestantism is false notice that's not the claim i'm making it's you promised clarity and we don't see clarity all right, so that's kind of where he's going to end here. And this is where then he starts getting into responding to different people. And throughout this video, he brings up these same arguments over and over. So what I want to say in regards to Joe 
is that when we look at scripture, this is what this is what we for sure know. We go to God's word. We know it from what Jesus taught, what the apostles taught, what we read from the prophets, right? If we want to know truth from error, the end of the day, God's word should always be our final authority. It doesn't mean that we can't study and examine things outside of God's word or can't learn from pastors or preachers or teachers, right? But at the end of the day, if we want to know who is, who is Jesus, we go to the Bible. We read scriptures. We find out what's going on there. If we want to know about the doctrine of the Trinity, God's word. If we want to know about is Jesus Christ the only way or is there another way? We go to God's word. If we want to find out did Jesus really die according to the scriptures? We go to the scriptures. Did he rise again from the according to the scriptures? We go to the scriptures. What happens when we die? We go to the scriptures. Where do we go when we die? We go to the scriptures. Is God the creator of all things? We go to the scriptures. Was Jesus Christ born of virgin birth? We go to the scriptures. Is the incarnation true? We go to the scriptures. The list goes on. God's word gives us exactly what we need. You ever heard the acronym Bible? Basic instructions before leaving earth. I mean, the Bible is our roadmap for history, for prophecy, for the teachings of Jesus, then and now and for the future. So this is my response to Joe, and I believe I gave a very satisfactory answer to Joe. Now, this is part one. I'm going to do part two for those of you out there who are troopers. I'm now going to go into why I believe Sola Scriptura is actually biblical, it's defended, and it's historical, okay? Even early on, early by the early apostolic, early on church leaders, okay? So if you are willing to go with that, that was part one. Now we're going to go into part two. So this is now known what's known as the Didache. And this is a source online, Christian History Institute. The Didache was something written basically in the first century that contained teachings and instructions, things that properly traditions passed on from the apostles of what they taught from God's word in teachings, right? And how do I know that? Well, let's read it together. Uh, Statement of Belief may be first, the first written catechism has four parts. The first is the two ways, the way of life, the way of death. The second explains how to perform rituals such as baptism, fasting, communion. Third covers ministry, how to deal with traveling travelers. Fourth part is remainder that Jesus is coming again. Now, notice this here. All different types of instruction that would have been passed on from them that we also get from where? God's word. With quotations from several New Testament passages which exhort Christians to live godly lives and prepare for that day. Now, in the Didache, there is these books that are referenced, different teachings that are directly referenced right here. So we got the book of Matthew referenced, the book of Luke referenced, Ephesians is referenced, Colossians is referenced, 1 Timothy is referenced, and 2 Thessalonians. This is early on, first century. Why is that, why is that relevant? Because it tells us early on these books from the New Testament were considered authoritative and inspired early on. This is just two. There are many other references here, but these are just two just to kind of give you a little taste. Clement of Rome, he wrote a letter to the Corinthians. He wrote a letter. It isn't written in scripture. It's inspired, but it was a letter they wrote to the Corinthians early on, roughly 95 AD. The following is a list of New Testament books that are referenced in the Clement of Rome letter to Corinthians. So notice here, his letter contains these references from scriptures, Matthew, Luke, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Titus, Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter. Why is it relevant? Because this was early on inspired teachings considered authoritative as scripture for teachings and doctrines. Notice here Polycarp, written to the Philippians, his letter to the Philippians, 110 AD roughly. He has a list of books. Look at the list he has. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, 1 and 2 Timothy, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Peter, and 1 John. Okay, Kelly, what are you talking about? Well, if we look at just those three accounts right there, 21, 21 
within around the first century already, or maybe even sooner, are recognized from roughly 50 to 100 AD, anywhere could be recognized as authoritative and inspired books as scripture for teachings and doctrines. So you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, three of the four gospels, the book of Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Titus, 1 and 2 Timothy, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. We got those right there. Hebrews is referenced. James is referenced. 1 and 2 Peter is referenced. And 1 John. So why is that relevant to what's being said here? This demonstrates early on the authority of Scripture, the inspiration of Scripture, and the importance of what they taught early on. Now, let's go through some Scriptures together what we see scripture teaching us about scripture. Jesus says in John chapter five, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. What testified about Jesus? The scriptures. What scriptures is he talking about? This in reference would be the holy scriptures known as the Tanakh. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you before the father. The one who accuses you is Moses. Now he's referencing the Torah, what's known as the law, in whom you've set your hope. So they put their hope in what the law taught. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So what did he say here? In order to believe me, who is Jesus Christ, who is God come in the flesh, incarnate, if you will, in order to truly believe Jesus, you must believe what Moses taught. Look at the importance of Scripture right there that Jesus gives us a basic principle of the authority of Scripture right there. Look at Luke chapter 24, verses 24 through 27. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women had said. But him they did not see, meaning Jesus. He said to them, this is Jesus, he's talking to these people, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Wow. That must have been one sola scriptura Bible study. Wow. Right? He went to scriptures to validate who he is, his crucifixion and his resurrection, going back to Moses and the prophets. Now he's appearing to his disciples. Now he's appearing to his disciples in Luke 24, verses 44 through 47. And he says this These are my words which I spoke. While I was with you, with all things that were written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So he says that Moses' writings, that's the Torah, prophets, there's a plethora, the minor, major prophets, a whole bunch there, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then open up their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it's written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. What's important here? Jesus, again, is pointing to scripture to validate who he is, what he taught, and now for them to believe and grow and learn and teach from here. It's very basic stuff here. The value of what Jesus, Jesus is pointing to scripture as authority. Now, again, he teaches his disciples in Matthew 20. We know the great commission. What does he say? Go, therefore, what does he say to his disciples? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does he then say? Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. That's interesting. He says, he's telling his apostles here, right? His early on disciples here, go and teach them all these things. Go make disciples. What does he say? Teach them all that I commanded you. That's where we get the value of what we get from the gospel, particularly say Matthew and John. And then we get the book of Acts, different things. What were they doing? They were teaching what Christ taught them. What do we see that? In written form. We see that being written down as being scripture. So again, the value of being passed on to inspired scripture. What does Paul say? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. He says, 
Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believe in me. Did you know that people could claim to believe in the gospel, yet they don't truly believe it? They believe in vain. There are people who can do lip service. There can people go through the motions. They can claim they believe at one point, but they really did not. This is the importance of truly knowing what the gospel is, what the gospel is not, and truly believing in your heart. What Christ did according to the scriptures of his death, burial, and resurrection, and that he truly is the only way, the Savior, and by trusting in him, you have eternal life. He says here, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died, according the, for, died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Isn't that what we just read in Luke 24? This goes hand in hand. This is what was passed on to Paul as he was now being an apostle of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and also be instructed, of course, from the other apostles early on as well. Look what Peter writes. First Peter chapter one, verse 10 through 12, writing to the different people early on. He writes this as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come. So where's it getting that? Old Testament prophets that prophesied about that grace that would come, that revelation of who Christ is of salvation, being saved by grace, made careful, sorry, careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and glorious fall. So early on, <clears throat> this goes back to what we've been reading from Jesus, and then of course the Apostle Paul. Early on, God revealed to different prophets. The coming of the Messiah, the sufferings of Messiah, and his resurrection to come. That's what we see early being taught. What it goes on to say, which have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Remember, Jesus said that after he would come, another would come, the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16, John 14, 26, John 15, 26, John 16, verse 7 through 15. He talks about the Holy Spirit to come, that he would lead people, he would speak and lead people to who the Father is, and who Jesus Christ is, and remind them of these things. That's what we see Peter, again, making reference to the teachings of who Christ is. Notice here in Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, it says, Now now we who are, who ought to be, uh, who, now we who are strong ought to bear the weakness of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification, for even Christ did not please himself, as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. He's referencing right there in that direct quote, Isaiah 53. Awesome. What does he say? For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Wow. So when we read the Old Testament, when we're going through God's word, the Old Testament, it was written for us for our instruction, for our learning, so that we can know right from wrong written for our so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope amen now look at these scriptures here with me there's a numerous scriptures some of them i've already been referencing earlier on when i was referencing previously Acts 17 2 through 3 what do we see paul's custom according to paul's custom he went to them for three sabbaths reason with them talking about the jewish people reason with them from the scriptures explaining and giving evidence that the christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead so what what does that mean paul's authority is he went to scripture to defend who christ is his death and his resurrection he went to scripture to validate to prove that to teach that Acts 17 10 through 11 the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they had arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Be, sorry, to see whether these things are so. I was jumping the gun there. Why is this relevant? Paul and Silas were there 
they're teaching these people. They're telling them about God. They're telling them about Jesus. They're talking about the gospel. And it says here, they received the word. With great so they were receiving what Paul and Silas were instructing them. What did we see? Examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. This is a basic fundamental. That's why my channel is called Berean Perspective. We go to God's word for the final say. It's not what I say. It's not what you say. It's not what your pastor says. It's not what your dog or cat says. It's what does God's word say at the end of the day. Amen? So we want to be good Bereans. We want to examine the scriptures, see whether it's these or so. It doesn't matter who's speaking it, who's saying it. That's the fundamental principle we see being taught in scripture. That's why sola, that's why sola scriptura is important. Second Timothy 2 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. What? What's your point? What are you doing? Accurately handling the word of truth. So we study the word of God. We study the Bible. We study the Old New Testament. And we want to do it, and we're not, we don't want to even be ashamed, right? We want to be confident. We want to know what it teaches. We want to know and understand it, and we want to accurately handle the word of truth. That takes time, takes discipleship, takes discipline. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 17. He says, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. Well, welcome to the party. They were persecuted early on in the first century. Christians have been persecuted throughout the last 2,000 years. Christians around the world are persecuted right now. If you want to live godly, you'll be persecuted. Some people are martyred for their faith. That's the reality of being a Christian. Truth at times will offend people. You can say it the nicest way, yet people will still get upset with you. But watch this. But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Look at what he says here to young Timothy. You, however... Continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them. So being taught things, but watch this. And that from childhood, you have known the sacred writings. What's that? That's the Old Testament, God's word, which are what? Able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So Paul says this, just like earlier on, talking about the gospel, earlier on, when I was responding to Joe, God's word teaches us that we can have faith to trust in Jesus Christ. Paul says the sacred writings will give us that wisdom to what? Leads us to have faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? And he goes on to say, all scripture is inspired by God. Theonikos, I think it's pronounced. Profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. That's the important, that's discipleship. That's mentorship. That's learning what God's word teaches so that we can be adequate. We can do it for training and righteousness so that we may live out this in our everyday lives. These are the basic principles what we see in God's word teaching us about Sola Scriptura. Here's some other scriptures. 1 Timothy 4, or sorry, 1 Timothy 3, 13, uh, 14 through 15, sometimes is used by Catholics to teach tradition. It says, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you not before long, but in case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how you ought to conduct yourself in the household of God. So the house of God, the church, right? Which is the church of the living God? So that's the conduct, the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So, Catholics a lot of times will say, see, the Catholic Church, you need the scriptures, you need the tradition, and you need the magisterium. That's not what's being taught here. The church itself is what we would be the communicators of God's word, the gospel. We are not the truth. The truth is of who Christ is and what the gospel is. We are the ones who support it, who teach it, who pass it on. That's what's being communicated. This is not teaching, as the Catholic apologists like to say, that you must have the tradition, scripture, and magisterium. All that Paul is saying here is that the church of the living God is the pillar and support of the truth, right? In other words, we're helping that. We're like, we're a part of that foundation, but we're not the rock. We're not Jesus Christ. He is the rock. 
Notice what it says here, another reference that's often used, 2 Thessalonians 2.15. So then, brethren, stand firm, hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or letter from us. Okay, so we understand God's word, scripture, right? Written word. But they were also being taught firsthand from the apostles. But then that would be passed on. Here's the thing. Tradition of itself, of itself is not bad. The difference is this. If anyone's claiming tradition, as they would have been back to being taught tradition, it would always line up with what was being taught by Jesus or the apostles and God's word. So if a tradition is coming along and someone teaches something that doesn't line up with the word of God, what's been taught by Jesus or the apostles or the prophets, that is to be rejected. Tradition itself is not bad, but it must line up with God's word. Look what Paul says, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Watch this. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Well, there we go. That goes back to 1 Timothy 3, right? So the foundation is built upon the apostles' teachings and the prophets, but notice this, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. He's the rock. He's the Petros. Peter is not. The church is built upon Christ and the revelation of who he is. In fact, if you were to read your Catechism 424, and ironically, the Catechism we have the church actually agrees with me what it said. Peter is not actually directly the rock. It's the confession of his faith in the revelation of Christ. Is, that's the rock. Go read Catechism 424. It's actually ironic. But here, Christ is our chief cornerstone. But notice here, built upon the apostles' teachings and the prophets. Look at Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elements of the world. What that? What then? Rather than according to Christ. How are we going to know what Christ taught if we don't know what the apostles taught from him? That's why it's important to know God's word. If we don't know the apostles' teachings, how will we know what Christ actually taught? That's, again, the value and the importance of the supremacy of what Scripture teaches, i.e. sola scriptura. Lastly, look at this here. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written. Now that principle right there is massive, because many people will go beyond what Scripture gives us, beyond what's actually being stated. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll eisegete things. They'll either read into something that's not there, or they'll take something that's not there and try to apply it to something else. We want to do what's called exegete. We exegete, meaning we expound upon from what's being written, expound what's being stated from there, and go from what's there being written. We don't try to make something up. Don't try to make something that's not there. We want to go with what's scripture. So here he says, do not exceed what's written so that none of you will become arrogant in behalf of, on behalf of one against another. And we say that very often. That's where a lot of people pride arrogance, knowledge, and things puff up. A couple more verses. 1 Timothy 6.3 If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those are the Lord Jesus Christ, and with doctrine conform to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. Again, the importance of what it means to adhere to the true teachings and doctrines of what Jesus taught. How will we know that unless we know what Scripture actually teaches? 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 through 5. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Well, we've got to know the word, right? We've got to be studiers, Bereans. We want to defend it, contend for it. Here's this. What's going to happen? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, turn away their ears from the truth, and turn aside the myths. Here's the thing. People at times will turn from Scripture. They will turn from truth, and they'll have tickling ears. That's why it's so important for us to be close to what God's Word teaches, to have accountability, to have discipleship, and have other brothers and sisters who can speak in our lives, pointing us back to what God's Word 
teaches. As I wrap up here, let me share just a couple of things quickly. As I wrap up here, I also want to highlight a few references early on pertaining to Sola Scriptura from early church fathers. Now, of course, I know that early church fathers, they'll talk about tradition, things that are passed on from the apostles, and things like that. But I want to be very clear in this. When we see those type of references, those traditions being passed on, they are primarily things that they get from God's word. Instructions and principles from God's word. And if any of these traditions that are being passed on, they will never violate or go against God's word. I submit to you traditions of men such as purgatory, intercession of the saints, things of uh, the Marian type doctrines, things of uh, the magisterium and the sacred tradition. Those are things that are contrary to what God's word actually teaches. Those are traditions of men. Let's look at what these guys got to say. Irenaeus of Lyons says here, and against heresies 3.1.1, he says this, We have learned from none others the plan of our salvation than those through whom the gospel has come down to us, which they did at one time proclaim in public and at a later period by the will of God, watch this, handed down to us in the scriptures, the scriptures, to be what? To be the ground and pillar of our faith. Wait a minute. The scriptures are to be the ground and pillar of our faith? Well, that kind of goes counter counterintuitive uh, to the Catholic teachings, the Catholicism teachings, right? Because they believe that it's scripture, tradition, and magisterium. According to here, it's the scriptures that are supposed to be the ground and pillar of our faith. That's what Irenaeus taught early on, and there's many other references like that. Against praxis, Tertullian states the following, uh, 11. It will be your duty, however, to adduce your proofs out of the scriptures as plainly as we do when we prove that he made his word a son to himself. He says, goes on to say, all the scriptures attest the clear existence of and distinction in the persons of the Trinity and indeed furnish us with our rule of faith. Tertullian also went to scripture as the final authority for our rule of faith and what we would go to to know these things on the existence of the Trinity, things like that. Again, pointing to Sola Scriptura. Dionysus, I just want to read the highlighted parts here, but this is from Eusebius Church History 7.24.8. He goes on to say, well, actually, let me read the whole quote. We did not evade objections, but we endured as far as possible to hold and confirm the things which lay before us. And if the reason given satisfies us, we were not ashamed to change our opinions and agree with others. But on the contrary, conscientiously and sincerely, with hearts laid open before God, we accepted whatever was established by the proofs and teachings of the Holy Scriptures. So we can have opinions and different thoughts, but he says, but we accepted whatever was established by the proofs and teachings of of the holy scriptures i.e the bible so once again scripture is that final authority that's what sola scriptura is all about gregory of nisa says here in regards to the dogmatic treaties book 12 let me read the highlighted part here actually let me read the whole thing they allege that while we confess three persons we say there is one goodness one power one godhead in this certain they do not go beyond the truth for we do say so but on the ground, their complaint is that their custom does not admit this. Watch this highlighted part. Scripture does not support it. What then is our reply? We do not think it's right to make their prevailing custom the law and rule of sound doctrine. In other words, just because they claim such and such to be true, we don't have to go by it. For if custom is to avail for proof of soundness, we too surely must advance our prevailing custom. If they reject this, we surely are not bound to follow theirs. Here's the final conclusion of what he's asking. About. Opinions, traditions, or do we go with scripture? Let the inspired scripture then be what? Be our umpire. And the vote of truth will surely be given to those whose dogmas are found to agree with the divine words. So notice here, let scripture be then our umpire, our vote of truth will surely be given to those whose dogmas are found to agree with divine words. 
You know, in the Roman Catholic Church, among many things and other things, they have many dogmas of Mary that do not line up with Scripture. They have many dogmas when it comes to the Pope that do not line up with Scripture. They have many things about salvation and water baptism as dogmas that do not line up with Scripture. So at the end of the day, whatever camp you're in or whatever background you may have, or Lutheran, Orthodox, Catholic, or anything else, Baptist, Pentecostal, whatever, at the end of the day, our umpire and our vote of truth should always be going back to what does Scripture teach. Notice here, Cyril of Jerusalem, the uh, catechetical lectures, 4.17, quote, Have thou ever in your mind this seal, which for the present has been lightly touched on in my discourse, by way of summary, but shall be stated, should the Lord permit, to the best of my power, with the proof from the scriptures, for concerning divine and holy mysteries of the faith, listen, not even a casual statement must be delivered without the holy scriptures. So see the final authority, the supremacy of scripture there? Nor must we be drawn aside by mere plausibility artifices of speech, even to me who tell you these things, give not absolute credence, unless thou receive the proof of the things which I announced to you from where? The divine scriptures. For this salvation which we believe depends not on ingenuous res, res, uh, reasoning, reasoning, but on the demonstration of the Holy Scriptures. Once again, where is the point for authority? God's Word, God's Scripture. And lastly, Basil the Great, Letters of Basil, Caesarea 283. Enjoying as you do the consolation of the Holy Scriptures, stand in need. You stand in need of neither my assistance nor anybody else to help you comprehend your duty. You have the all-sufficient counsel and guidance of the Holy Spirit to lead you to what is right. Going back to what Christ taught about the Holy Spirit. So in conclusion, on Sola Scriptura, the importance of Sola Scriptura, those who object to it, various people, Catholics, Orthodox, and others out there, I want to submit to you just a final concluding thoughts. Matthew 28, 18, 20 again, Jesus said, Go therefore make disciples of all nations baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that command you. How do we know what Jesus taught unless we go to his scriptures from the apostles? How do we know what Jesus taught unless we go to the epistles or the book of Acts? Paul says in Ephesians 2.20, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. It's not built upon Peter. Peter is not the only one. Peter is one of them, but the foundation of the apostles, not Peter, but of the apostles and prophets. So this is collectively. And what? Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. That's the stone which anything of any kind of foundation is being laid. That's the cornerstone. He is the rock. 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed. What? Accurately handling the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. Colossians 2 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, empty deception, according to tradition of men, according to the elements principles of the world, rather than according to Christ, rather than according to Christ. So if someone tries to teach you something that goes against what Christ taught, you don't accept it. That gets it, that again goes to the supremacy of Sola Scriptura. Lastly, Acts 17. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night, but when they arrived, when the synagogue of Jews, now these were more noble minded than those in Thessalonica. For they receive the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. So in conclusion, my brothers and sisters, Sola Scriptura is biblical. Based on God's word, we see it from the teachings of Jesus, the teaching of the apostles, and even early on from early apostolic church fathers and leaders. So I submit to you and thank you for watching this video today. Please share your thoughts with what you think about this. What do you think about Sola Scriptura? Do you think it's a good argument? Think it's a bad argument? Let me know. And also, to the response to Joe. Thank you, Joe. I hope that you see the video that I've done. I hope that you respond to it. And I hope anyone out there checked out what I shared, saw that his argument couldn't be backed up, and it was actually refuted by scripture. 
Thank you for being here. Lord bless you. And may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and trust in his word, study God's word day and night, daily. Test what you're being taught by pastors, preachers, YouTube people, whoever, to see whether what they're stating is true or false. Lord bless.